Hello, hello. It's the Japan Zumina at UC San Diego. It's May 31st, 2022 in San Diego, which makes it June 1st in Japan. Ohayou gozaimasu. I'm Oreka Shida. I'm a professor of Japanese business at UC San Diego and the director of JFID, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. This event is hosted at GPS, the School of Global Policy and Strategy. GPS is an international relations and public policy school. And uh, among our, our various offerings is a master's of international affairs with a Japan specialization. You can find more information on GPS at gps.ucsd.edu. And at GPS, we're JFIT, the Japan Center. And more information on JFIT, you can find at jfit.ucsd.edu. If you were to go there, you would find uh, the following tabs. Uh, and one of them is called News and Media. Here you can sign up for our JFIT San Diego Japan News Flash, which we try to make um, uh, interesting and funny. Doesn't always work, but we certainly try. And uh, right next to it is our uh, tab for the Japan Zoominar. And before I show you what that looks like, let me remind you that our Zoominars are recorded and you can find links to past events at that tab, Japan Zoominars. Um, and, and today, uh, given that this is recorded, note that uh, you should feel free, please, uh, to type any questions into the Q&A box. Uh, I will refer to you only by your first name to protect your privacy. And uh, we actually a regular event, except we'll be taking a summer break. No worries, we will most certainly be back after this event. Uh, in the meantime, do feel free to explore our uh, gallery with the past events. Uh, if you go to this gallery, it looks like this. There's a uh, business and economy, politics, society, and everything else from Hello Kitty to uh, mafia to foreign relations to war, we're covering it all. Uh, it looks like this and then you can click and you can go there and, and enjoy. While you're on the website, and since this is the last event of the year, let me ask you whether you might be kind enough to consider helping us and supporting our efforts. It's the end of the academic year, which means we've done more than 30 of these events over the last couple of months, last month. And uh, uh, it's we're a nonprofit organization. And this uh, Zoomina is, uh, is for you and is by us. Uh, if you are so inclined, if you feel so inclined, click the support button and uh, go to give now, which is actually twice on that, <laughs> and in gold. So there you have it. Every single penny helps uh, uh, any, any gesture of giving, of course, any large amount would be gladly taken as well. And with that, let's go to crisis uh, media and crisis communications in Japan. And I don't know whether I communicated my gig there just now really well, but uh, I will learn shortly because I have David Wagner with us today. And I uh, will talk about these guys here apologizing for all the bad deeds in their past. Let me stop it and introduce David. There he is. Hi, David. Hey. Good morning, good morning in Tokyo. Uh, good afternoon to you. How are you? Yeah, <laughs> great. It's great to have you here. Uh, David, uh, let me let me introduce you. So David Wagner is one of Asia's leading authorities on media crisis and business communication skills. He's coached over 30,000 French trainees from presidents, CEOs, ambassadors. I don't know about the mafia, but uh, also mid-level people um, on effective message delivery. Uh, he's also been a lecturer at Waseda and the Institute of Public Administration and Management in Singapore. He's the author of 24 um, books that are sort of help books, uh, including The Skills to Take Action and a large number of other ones. He began his career as a journalist, I believe with the Denver Post, David, and, right. uh, and then was a columnist at the Mainichi Daily News and had an NHK series on communications as well. He holds an MA from Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey and has been in Japan and been a communications helper, tutor, consultant, uh, for more than three decades. So David, it's great to have you here. It's wonderful to have an expert and, uh, and I hope to coach me later on that, uh, um, on, on that pitch I just made. It was probably not Thanks as- Thanks for that uh, introduction. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Uh, no, I've never uh, done any work with the mafia. Just to be- <laughs> That was just a but joke. I, I would consider it actually. It might sound kind of interesting. So, so, so David, before we start to get into the weeds of this, our audience is very much mixed today. So I thought I'd start out with some sort of intro question. Can you tell us what a communications consultant does? Well, I can tell you what I do. 
um, and it's related to media management They're pretty much exclusively these days. Uh, I started doing this just over 22 years ago at an agency here in Tokyo. I was one of 60 candidates that wanted the job of leading this, uh, this operation for media and crisis training exclusively. Because, you know, most agencies, they, they, they have media and crisis trainers that are also account executives. But I was working for a firm that did it uniquely, which was exclusively media and crisis training. And I did that for about uh, 14 years. And then I went out on my own about eight years ago. So what I do is work with public and private sector organizations to help prepare them to engage the media. That's what I do. And, 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 and are media and crisis sessions sort of, that's a different, those are two different animals, right? Yeah, there's some overlap. So a crisis session is, is much more comprehensive. It, it tests the executive team, for example, president, head of HR, head of legal, whatever is in the room. How are they operating under a crisis scenario where there's a simulation that's engaged and created? And I love creating these simulations because my mind gets to go into all kinds of dark places. Uh, and then um, at the end of the day, the overlap comes with the media engagement part because the spokesperson has to talk to media and I train people to be prepared for all kinds of questions and how to manage that with their messages. Great. So um, I understand you brought us some PowerPoints to, to explain all of this to us in a more structured way. Why don't we uh, dive into those? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Um, let me just pull these up. And um, just to, oh, I'm a little bit behind there. Sorry about that. Uh, we were going over this earlier. I didn't okay. bring it back. There you go. So let me just go over the goals from my perspective, what I want to do for the next um, hour or so. Share insights on managing the media based on my experiences uh, with the public and private sector. So again, this is not so much academic and research oriented. It's based on ex it's experiential learning, really. And then um, offer some suggestions on managing the media as a whole. So I'm going to spend some time talking about crisis and what is it and how does it work. And then uh, probably about 10 minutes from now, I'll be going into Japan specific things. I think people will find it kind of useful to go over that. So I'll go over it quickly. Let's start off by asking, when does a problem become a crisis? Uh, do you have an answer for that? Uh, when it becomes public? Yeah, when it becomes public. So the likelihood of media exposure means it becomes a crisis because it's no longer an internal issue, right? And that's the point at which, you know, the way in which the media treats the crisis determines the large extent the impact of the crisis and that's where we start right so a problem uh, sexual harassment issue internally is not a crisis really it is for the company internally but when you go to the media it's a problem and the reason it's a problem is because social media has made everyone with a cell phone and a camera a journalist I, I don't know how many cell phones with cameras there are in the world five billion or something that means we've got five billion more journalists than we used to have and uh, that's a problem for any organization. And uh, there's some ways to think about managing that. So we have in some Japan, journalists on the show. Let's just make clear that we fully understand that those people are not journalists, journalists. They're gawkers or uh, picture posters. Well, everyone in my book is potential journalists. So that's the way I look at the world, right? Um, but fair enough. In Japan, I think some interesting things that are kind of more recent in terms of frequent developments or whistleblowers and anonymous tips. Um, this bypasses traditional media and provides new paths for public disclosure. So uh, we're going to talk about how it works here and traditionally how it's worked. But, you know, there's a lot more whistleblowers and anonymous tips than there used to be. And that's sort of new in terms of the frequency here in Japan. So let's talk again about the uh, importance of the non-Japanese in this, in this mix. They add a little bit of spice with Gaiatsu, which is outside pressure. And then there's the foreign media as a whole, which, which doesn't necessarily play by the Japanese rules, which we'll talk about. So this is sort of the, the context in which I wanna start the conversation. Let's talk about the impact of a crisis. Um, a crisis, as we know, can threaten an institution's reputation. And in extreme cases, a crisis can totally destroy an organization. And we've seen that happen all over the world, not just Japan. Um, typical crisis situations, we can look at this list I put up. Uh, the ones that are least predictable are, of course, natural disasters. We have them plenty here in Japan, earthquakes, tsunami, uh, typhoon. Uh, and it's, 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 it is critical to be able to sort of plan for that. I think the Japanese have done a pretty good job of doing earthquakes. They've got sensors in the ocean now that gives trains an extra five seconds before they stop. So uh, it's one of the most advanced in the world with that kind of thing. 
So, but you know, most most crises are are more predictable than not, and uh, industries such as these listed have a lot of preparation time for what can happen for food products. You can have a food poisoning example. Uh, I was doing a, a training for a food company and they had a real life call center and the call center got a call from a mafia in Kyushu who said his cat died of eating cat food. Okay, who thought of that? Mafia with a cat. Um, but this is the kind of things that you give me money or I'm going public with this revelation. And this is the kind of thing we have to deal with. Now, transportation airlines, they know what can happen. Crashes, explosions, hijackings. A lot of these things are very predictable, but not always right. So when we talk about, you know, main categories of crisis, there are some stages that most crises go through. And I'm going to talk about these four sort of one by one right now. The pre-crisis phase is the warning stage where there's an advanced sign of trouble. For instance, a disgruntled employee sends a threatening letter. It's possible to avert the crisis, but in a limited period of time, and the organization has to act quickly, right? So then comes the actual crisis, the acute crisis phase, and that's where the full-blown crisis happens. Um, and there's no way to avoid it. It could be physical, financial, or reputational damage, but something has to be done to ensure the organization's reputation outlasts the crisis. And it's all about managing reputations at the end of the day and companies that don't do that fail. And this is where the media gets involved. And then there's the chronic stage, which is the cleanup um, steps are taken to handle and minimize the crisis. In the case of Fukushima, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, the nuclear cores had already melted and they were being kept cool. Water, so it's not over, but it's, it's more managed than it was. And then comes the resolution stage. Um, this is where normality to some extent returns to the pre-crisis level. Uh, lessons learned to prevent recurrence where you can do that. You can't do that with a natural disaster. But in the case of Fukushima, they turned off all the nuclear plants by 2012 or safety checks. So these are the pretty common things that, you know, set the stage for what we want to talk about. Um, and some of the key points, again, are that most crises are predictable and manageable. Most, keyword. Um, most are, are Non-preventable crises can be better managed with advanced planning, which is obvious, but a lot of companies don't do it. Uh, many corporate crises are triggered by management or employees themselves. Uh, many companies facing a crisis situation are guilty of something, not always, but oftentimes, and many crises are poorly managed, and there are lots of cases that in Japan. So some of the common causes here in Japan that I've found from my work is uh, incompetence, in managing it and, and letting it happen in the first place, withholding information, which is really common in Japan for lots of reasons, or oversight management or compliance, uh, protecting relationships may take priority over institutional reputation. And that's a really important one. Uh, Ningen Kanke or human relationships uh, often take precedent over the institutional health of, of, a, of a company. And then maintaining relations prevents public disclosure a lot of the time. And there are many factors involved with that. So um, let's look at some quick lessons from the past um, and managing crisis in Japan. And there aren't many good examples that I like to choose, but one of the ones where they got it right was the terrible crash of the Japan Airlines uh, jet about uh, 35 years ago. 520 people killed. I think it's the second worst air disaster in, in history. I think the first was that one in the Canary Islands where two 747s crashed together tarmac. Um, why, was it, why was it handled well? Well, the president apologized at the memorial service and accepted responsibility and offered to resign. Um, victims were notified quickly. There were financial reparations. Advertising was suspended. Employees accompanied and helped bereave families, attended funerals. It was a culture-driven response, humane, caring, and responsible, and genuinely so, I think. And, you know, Jal lost some market share, but eventually made a full recovery. Uh, that's that's as, pretty much as good as it gets over here, as from my experience. Let's talk about getting it wrong. One of the famous ones was over 20 years ago with Snow Brand Milk Products and the food poisoning where 14,000 people became ill. And so why was that wrong? Well, mid-level executives were afraid to share information with the top. They provided media with inaccurate information, covered up the facts and resisted product recall. That's not good. Uh, they appeared more concerned with reputation and status than the people who'd been poisoned. That's not good. 
And the president had a famous quote, you know, he said to the media in a press conference, I haven't slept for days, to which one of the media responded saying, I haven't either. <laughs> so that didn't go over very well. Sympathy there was not accepted. And then, of course, there was a second uh, scandal, uh, beef, beef mislabeling, which occurred about a year later, and the Snow brand, uh, brand ceased to exist. It was dissolved. Um, let's not stop there. The other famous one in that year, uh, or near that year, was uh, Olympus Optical, which is a really uh, famous case involving foreigners. One of the biggest and longest running loss hiding schemes in Japanese history, but not the biggest. Uh, irregular payments for acquisitions had resulted in very significant asset impairment charges, billion and a half in investment losses with dubious fees and other payments dating back, you know, over like 30 years. And there was suspect, uh, suspected uh, involvement with mafia. Then there's Fukushima, which I got pretty much involved in, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The, uh, the uh, tsunami that affected the nuclear plant um, about uh, 10 years ago. So TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power, and the government held information about the level of damage for months. You know, radiation is measurable; can't really hide that. And uh, incalculable damage was done to. Japan's government, policymakers, and TEPCO itself, which continues to recover its reputation. So during this time, you know, I wanted to help. I was watching the press conferences in English because uh, I, I strictly do English media support. And uh, there were some good government spokespersons. The chief spokesperson was great, Shikata-san. But uh, many of the others were a disaster and I had, I had trouble watching it and I just wanted to help. So. I contacted the government, contacted the prime minister's office. I got permission to help for three weeks, observing um, a lot of the uh, press conferences and giving feedback. So uh, that was a volunteer effort and I was really helped, happy to do so. I'm talking too much. Do you have any comments or questions so far? Oh, you've got your, your uh, mic is off, I think. Sorry about that. We had some airplanes flying over, so I didn't want to bother everybody. So yeah, this is very interesting. Um, uh, and thank you for reminding us of these cases, because that's, um, you know, that's kind of gets us into the, into the mood. But I think the audience and, and I, for sure, I'm now wondering, well, but isn't part of this just like how it's done? So, so are these people that are incompetent in, in your, in, 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 in your judgment, are they maybe just bound by, this is how it's done in Japan, and uh, as you mentioned, the uh, Ninken Kange, Kanke and so forth, so the sort of the, the this was my friend, or this was our trusted supplier, or something. So I think we're all curious now to hear uh, what the what the uh, what the better way of doing it would be for Japan. So so how well, can you I'm uh, I'm leading up to that, um, but the, the short answer is first of all, I don't think everyone's incompetent. There's plenty of competent people. They're just not trained. Uh, and they don't have experience doing it. It's a skill, you know, you don't get good at golf by just doing golf once in a while. You know, you've got to be really skilled at these things and take it seriously. I think that's the biggest thing that I found here. And, and I'm not done with the crisis. There's Kobe Steel, which was, you know, falsified data for 50 years. I mean, this is unbelievable, right? Um, third largest steel maker engaged in widespread data fraud. They supplied products and falsified specifications to 500 customers burn global supply chains and terminal and the CEO resigned. But, you know, there's questions today over its corporate culture and the scandal is evolving itself, right? I mean, 50 years of lying, that's, that's incredible. That's that, that human relationship taking priority over what's good for the organization. It really is an astonishing crisis. So, you know, what's the obvious way to, to get ready for crisis? You know, the answer is not rocket science, it's preparation. And why don't some organizations prepare? Well, they treat a lot of these events as low probability or impossible that they won't happen at all. Unrealistic optimism among executives. Threats to reputation are often ignored or sometimes underestimated. And these are the common things that happen. Um, and there, you know, it requires to be prepared a plan. And the plan often includes vulnerability assessments, readiness assessments, crisis preparedness, uh, prepare manuals, uh, procedures, and make sure that everyone's ready to go with those. Issues monitoring capability. And of course, what I do, uh, this is what I spend most of my time on, is, is training key personnel and having backup spokespersons, for example, making sure that the messages are ready to go. This is where I spend a lot of my time. 
you know, when we talk about managing the media, every organization has to be ready in, in, in case there's a crisis. And the first response is really, really critical. Uh, it's essential to establish control and credibility and any hesitancy in responding could be seen as a sign of confusion, unconcern, incompetence, or even worse. And so this comes very quickly, I'll go over what are called the four R's, regret, resolution, reform, and restitution. And this is all part of the initial response process uh, to a typical crisis. You know, regret is to say that you're sorry that it happened, not that you're guilty of anything, not that you're even responsible, but did you regret the event has occurred? And state what you're going to do to resolve it. Can, if it's not your fault, then say nothing. Uh, reform, if you can, that it won't happen again. And in some cases, some form of restitution, most people want something, future discounts, free products, and the formula usually works pretty well. So, you know, is Japan doing things right? How about the case of Japan? Is it different? Uh, the answer <laughs> I'm copying out is saying yes and no. And I'll talk about the yeses first. This is where you wanted to go, uh, the discussion. So Japanese culture and norms play a role, which we can all guess. Uh, one of the things that happens is uh, the Japanese media norm of silence takes over. And the silence is in involving advertising conglomerates that often protect corporate sponsorships because they often influence the media and they have a lot of control historically. But that's not always the case. Um, this is challenged by local papers, tabloids, and sports, sports magazines, which are not beholden to these advertising agencies as much, and will very often be the ones that uh, let the cat out of the bag about what's going on. And then once that happens, uh, mainstream media jumps on board, and that happens pretty frequently. It's not always the case. Uh, and of course, we have whistleblowers and things that I've mentioned earlier, but this is what happens a lot of the time. So language is another one, another component. You know, Japanese language is indirect. Implied or vague messages are often interpreted positively. And this affects the way both the media and the public are engaged. Uh, you know, Taihen Moshiwaki goes, I must say, I have no excuse. Um, okay, Muzukashi Jokyo desu it's a difficult situation. What does that mean? But you know, it, it comes down to modesty. And uh, Japanese often pay attention to the mode of the expression more than the actual words. Modesty works, but the delivery needs to be sincere. And that having been said, modesty works, but it has its limits. You know, there still needs to be a solid strategy of effective messaging to target audiences, and that can help. I'll, I'll just stop and see if you have any questions so far. Yeah. Um... You know, I think I think this is all right. So, you know, we should probably get out of the PowerPoints because people can't actually not see us while the ah, PowerPoints okay. are on and then or at least okay. and so uh, let's have some human faces here as we, ah, yeah. as we sure. wander through the through the slides. Um, you know, um, I was just actually thinking that everything you said until is Japan different would happen in the United States as well. I mean, we make a big deal out of Kobe and the 50 years and, and whatnot, but I can, for every Japanese scandal, I can give you an American scandal or a German yep. scandal. I mean, yep. anybody remember Deutsche Bank, right? So it, it, it's it, it's just inherent in a lot of these businesses. So Hans actually has a very good question on this particular point that I wanted to bring in, which which was your early, our early sort of uh, quiz question, when does a problem become a crisis? And it becomes a crisis when it's known in public is there are there examples where you might say let's keep it quiet and just solve it and not i mean so is it actually a good thing if it doesn't become public oh yeah that's the ultimate goal right it's reputation management if it doesn't become public it's less of, a, of an issue it's an internal crisis but not an external crisis so i always so thought that, that would be that would be a, a target absolutely yeah, so that would be. I, I, I always thought that that was Woodward, Woodford's mistake. That that this. Well, is he was the whistleblower, right, in the Olympus scandal, right, and he paid the price for it. He his his head was chopped, and he wrote a book about it, made a million dollars or whatever he did, right. Um, but he was a whistleblower, if I'm not mistaken. But he was also the CEO, so it wouldn't have have been his fiduciary duty to to make sure that it doesn't become public and that it gets soft and cleaned and Olympus remains a strong company and rather than putting it up on the top lot. Well, we'd have to interview him and ask him his opinion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You would think so. You would think so. 
But yeah. you know, uh, he probably had some some moral and ethical issues. Uh, you know, I, I'm not quite sure. sure. Yeah, I mean, the other question I had on that, I don't know what else you have there in the, on the on, on how Japan is different, but. Uh, while you're talking about the sincere apology and the there's a ritual around that right so there's this there's this uh press conference where the teary-eyed ceo you know effusively kind of falls on his sword almost always a his I, I haven't seen a situation like that with a woman actually i don't remember um so male ceo crying apologizing to all the you know the customers and the employees and whatnot um, and 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 that's a right. That's almost a right of you know. It has to happen. If it were happening, people expected. would feel it's expected, right? And yeah. and I always thought that that was that was uh, Carlos Ghosn's problem. That that precisely that he didn't do what was expected of him in this particular moment, and thereby opening the floodgates to you know all kinds of. Well, mistakes. now that's a complicated uh, topic, um, which is ongoing, right? I mean, the Carlos Ghosn case is is one for the record books. But again, it brings in the fact that he's a foreign CEO, a non-Japanese CEO, and he didn't play by the rules because he didn't feel the rules were in his favor. And it, you, it's true, you know, Nissan has been dragged through the mud on this thing. Uh, the truth is yet to be known, which side is telling the truth or is there some layer of both sides telling the truth? Uh, well, it's an I ongoing, mean, it's an ongoing at this point, At this point, isn't it about making sure that Nissan doesn't go away? Well. Yeah, for Nissan, from Nissan's point of view, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, this is a complicated one, and I'm I'm going to refrain from too much commentary on it. But if it if it was really a national issue of not wanting Nissan to join with Renault and Nissan lose its national car status as a Japanese entity, uh, that's politics involved in this thing, and that that's a really complicated crisis. Uh, including that that's true for the current one as well i mean so 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 many interesting topics i just want to make sure because i interrupted you on the powerpoints whether you had other points on how yeah uh, japan is different before we open up the um the yeah. GMA here yeah i do let's go back to that so so far we had the the language which of course is fabulous in covering things up you know as if we, if we wanted to cover something up please do it in japanese well, it's 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 really convenient that Japanese is indirect because yeah. you don't have to say much and people can interpret it the way they want. And that's right. Um, what else can you say? It's it's culture. It's Japanese culture. Um, so you know, I've talked about the fact that aid agencies often protect large institutions. Japanese language is indirect. I've talked about you know showing remorse and that's expected. We talked about the bow and what we haven't talked about was what I call the empty bow, which is you know if there's a 50 year crisis, 50 years of withholding information from the public or 50 years of falsifying data, I call that the empty bow. Why did that happen in the first place? You can bow and ask for, for, for forgiveness, but why 50 years administration after administration did they hide this from shareholders? I mean. We can go into that. Uh, that's a really complicated topic, but uh, I coined the phrase empty bow about five years ago, and uh, it happens a lot here. I, some of it is sincere, some of it's not, but, but we can talk can about I, it. Can I just maybe come to the good Kobe Steel CEO's defense here for a moment? Sure. I mean, yes, there had been a culture in that company that was wrong, but this CEO was in the office for only two years. But, and you know, and maybe that's not an excuse, because he had been with the company for 40 years, so he knew it all along because he had been working for the company. Maybe he knew it, maybe he didn't. But um, are you saying, I mean, in Japan, CEO system is completely different because they're not being paid the big bucks. They're, they're paid a little bit more money to take responsibility for the employees and the longevity of the company, right? So why is, the, why is, that, uh, why, why is that empty? It, he could have been completely sincere and well, as hurt as everybody else who works for the company. I would say it's not always empty. And, and I would say it's case by case. Uh, but if there's open lying and everybody knows that this was done for decades, it's hard for me to believe there's a lot of sincerity. Let's just put it that way. But that's not my job. I'm not there to judge whether it's sincere or not. I'm there to help with reputation management. So Akira actually has a question on this on this uh, apology thing uh, at the press conference. So when we see it, yeah, like you and I, we kind of look at this and say, "Oh, really? That's all they got, right? They're teary-eyed, and I'm so sorry for everybody." Um, but 
but but within Japan, it's not seen as that, right? So when we see that, we also need to understand that there are, you know, that that for for within Japan, it's it's completely effective. So we can't. Well, it's just... expected. It's expected, um, and and it is done for that reason. Uh, to what extent? I'd be curious to know if anyone's done research on to what extent younger people. By, by that kind of sincerity compared to the older generations. That'd be an interesting uh, research topic for someone to do a PhD. Well, it's, it's like with everything that is a right, right? So we expect it, and we only mind it if it's not there. Maybe so. Yeah, I'm not gonna judge, you know, what's going on here in Japan cross-culturally, right? right? Yeah. I'm just saying what the norms are. And again, my, my job is to help an organization make sure that they survive and succeed because these crises are also opportunities to regain trust with the public over time. If it's managed well, it can be done successfully. I think that's the main point, right? So uh, another Japanese aspect to this uh, is a question actually that, that Taka is raising. And that is, you, you talked about preparation and being ready and having sort of a script in the drawer just in the case that there, you know, just in case there's a tsunami, or just, which is, <clears throat> you know, certain likelihood, but just in case there is a, a, a product recall, which is also a certain likelihood. And uh, he's wondering whether maybe part of the, the sort of the root cause of this non-preparation is that generally in Japanese companies, the PR department is often uh -huh. not professionally managed. Yes, well, I've got, I've got slides on that. Let me- uh, Oh yeah, okay, me, good, okay. Let me, I, that's exactly where I was gonna go down okay, the road Okay, let's go there. Let me let me uh, fast forward and see if I can find it. And I'm no, 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 no. Can just go through your slides and see what else you got there. Yeah, well, that comes up. That comes up. Let me, right. let me try to move through Let's this see. quickly. I did put a logical, structured presentation yeah. together. It, it actually turns out that the people can't see us, so there's no pressure. So let's. Okay. Let's Fantastic. Go. Great. Yeah. So let me just go to this next point, which is um, information flow generally takes more time with layers of consensus formation needed. This is really apparent in Japan in many, many organizations. And a lot of times information decision-making is siloed from department to department or government agency to government agency. And it really does slow things down, but it happens a lot here. And it's part of the process, which makes Japan a little bit different. Um, you know, the concept of waiting until information is confirmed before sharing with the public follows Japanese norm. But when we talk about global stakeholders and global organizations, they may have different expectations. So slowing, uh, or slow decision making often clashes with global expectations regarding information sharing and communication transparency and that often leads to conflict which can be perceived as things like deception uh, lacking transparency or again that issue of incompetence so it's much better to admit uncertainty than to present information as 100 percent certain and be wrong later uh, it's better to just say we don't have all the facts but here's what we know now uh, instead of waiting till you get, you know, you cross all your T's and dot all your I's. Uh, that's, that's, uh, J Japanese generally are risk averse uh, as a whole. And that explains why when we talk about the PR department and the way in which information flows, things are often very different here. So, you know, we talked about the PR department. This is where it comes in. Is the PR department seen as vital in Japan? Well, my answer is probably predictable. That depends on the organization. Uh, not all Japanese organizations handle it the same way. Not all foreign organizations handle it the same way. Um, in Japan, most large companies have in-house corporate communication departments. We know this, right? However, they are often managed by employees who were transferred mid-career and sometimes do not have professional communications background or even training. That's not the case with all organizations, but many. And so many Japanese firms do not have a proper global media management process in place to handle the crisis, instead companies rely on local management to resolve issues that arise. And leadership is often unable to take decisive action because they lack in-house crisis communications professionals with required expertise to guide them. So again, this is where uh, uh, Japan may be a little bit different. So when managers in Japan are confronted with an emergency situation, there's often an impulse to move slowly and deal with things privately behind the scenes, which is not a bad strategy as a whole, but time is not on your side, right? The media in turn may see this as evasive behavior and respond by trying to get to the bottom of the story. The more management tries to hide, the more journalists are motivated to probe even more deeply, right? Um, 
it happens time and time again. We see it all the time. So, you know, Japan is different when it comes to non-Japanese spokespersons compared to Japanese spokespersons. Uh, international companies operating in Japan need to be sensitive to cultural specific communication processes, standards, and values before engaging the media in a crisis. And that sounds kind of obvious, but it's not always the case. You know, I've been in many media training situations where the, the president or the CEO is just transferred to Japan is not a Japan specialist, doesn't understand how things work. Kind of like um, my country's uh, American ambassadors that come here that are not Japan specialists. There's a there's a list of them in recent years, which, you know, I keep looking back to the Mike Mansfield days, wondering if we'll ever get a Mike Mansfield. Again. But I digress. Um, Japan has long uh, so cultural expectations, and if they're met, non-Japanese CEOs uh, can produce positive results. Uh, speaking English, being the right interpreter, can also produce favorable outcomes. For non-Japanese CEOs, speaking in Japanese is not a requirement and may even be counterproductive. And I say this because unless you're completely fluent and like, you know, we're born and raised here, I wouldn't even go there, right? And interpreters, you know, are helpful from a lot of perspectives, especially if you've got the choice of simultaneous or conference interpretation, I would choose conference, which means, you know, you say something and they interpret, you say something they interpret versus simultaneous because it gives you more time to think. So uh, I, I often encourage uh, non-Japanese spokespersons to definitely use interpreters, even if they speak good Japanese. Isn't there even a legal risk in this? I mean, because you, if no. you don't get the nuance exactly right, right, you may have just started some bigger issue, right? That's right. There's yeah. that. There's that for sure. But it's, again, about control of the message and control using time. And time is not on your side when the glaring lights of the media are on you. You can do whatever you can to give yourself some more time. Um, and then um, knowledge of and respect for Japanese cultural differences are, of course, vital for successful communication processes in international organizations. And I highlight this um, because there are many instances where non-Japanese CEOs understand this place and have been here a long time. There's a lot of them, but there's even more that don't. And that's where it gets to be a little bit dangerous, actually. Um, so when it comes to the media in a crisis, I don't really think Japan is all that different from any other place in the world that I've been to and worked in where the media in a crisis situation acts and, in, and inter, interacts. You know, when the story's out, Japanese journalists are no less aggressive in a crisis than in the West. You know? uh, they'll, they'll dig deeply and persistently stay on the story. And, and that's something that I think is not different in Japan. Um, so, you know, some other things to think about. Um, Chosen spokesperson should be a person who's best suited to be the public interface in a crisis situation. And that sounds obvious again, but there's a lot of things that need to go into that, you know, visually and verbally, you know. Uh, I, was doing a, I was doing a training with a CEO of an insurance company who was in the Indian National here in Japan. And the Indian National had an interpreter who was a Swiss male. So you've got an Indian National as the CEO and a Swiss interpreter in Japanese uh, and English. And I, I stopped it, I said, this is not working, you know, because the Swiss interpreter is gonna become the story. All the Japanese are gonna look at it and say, you know, wow, his Japanese is really good. Where did he come from? How did he learn his Japanese? So I said, let's get him out of there. I hate to be PC about this, but let's get a 50 something Japanese woman with gray hair uh, so she, the, the focus is not on the interpreter, the focus is on CEO. Uh, and so, you know, should a foreign CEO of an insurance company be the spokesperson? I don't know. Uh, just because he or she's the CEO, does that mean that they're the right person? I don't know. We need to look at the overall issues, right? And that's, a, that's a kind of a global issue. But the spokesperson's purpose is to turn the situation into an opportunity that will, again, rehabilitate trust. and. Um, I think gaining trust of all stakeholders, both internal and external, is critical to establishing and maintaining credibility. Providing consistent information among decision makers will help in crafting streamlined messages that all spokespersons can share. It will help for sure. So some additional thoughts, and then I'll stop the slides. Um, most companies and products survive a crisis. Uh, a crisis is both about the event itself and the company's ability to manage the response. And there are a lot of moving parts with that. And surviving a crisis provides a huge opportunity. A company can emerge stronger than if it takes 
uh, than ever if it takes these lessons to heart. So I think I'll just stop there and come back Fantastic. to you. Thank you. So, um, so there, there's so much here. Uh, let me let me see whether I can start a conversation here. And we're having questions coming in in the Q and A. So you, they're, they're like kind of um, there. There is the risk averse thing that you mentioned. So in a in a tough situation, uh, maybe the typical Japanese CEO will rather say less than more, right? So because more, that's what they learn early on in school, I guess. There's also being humble and coming across as truly humble is is halfway there. So that explains some of the things that we as foreigners might not pick up on, but yeah. But then Martin uh, adds another issue to that, and that is whether the government is sometimes involved. And so I'm thinking back to the old days, to the old Japan, when a lot of the corporate risk was socialized by way of having a government ministry sign off on a project, let's say, you know, some big investment in, in, I don't know, in the forests of Borneo, and it goes bad, and there's a scandal, and suddenly we have not only the company who invested, but we also have the fact that the government initially signed off on this project. So the CEO of the company doesn't want to say something because he doesn't want to get into trouble and so forth and so on. So, so and, and does the government actually still play a role in some of this? Well, I, I can't say it's for sure. It depends on the specific situation. There's times when the government's involved and times when it's not, just like anywhere else in the world. I think it all comes back to a strategy. You know, if you know you're investing in Borneo and you're involved with some nefarious uh, interchange, part of your strategy is going to be what happens if this becomes public and what are we going to do about it? It's a preparation issue. Uh, it doesn't matter that, that the government's so the government's involved or not. It, it, all the moving parts have to be coordinated and this has to be part of an overall strategy. And by the way, I wanted to meta comment. You said less is more and I'm a great believer in that. You know, the less you say as a spokesperson, the better off you are. You know, you, you don't want to talk in paragraphs, you want to talk in sentences. You know, if you think about when you're quoted in the Wall Street Journal, okay, let's say I do an interview with you. If you're lucky, how much of that 30, 45, 60 minute interview is going to be in the newspaper? Five words. Yeah, one sentence, maybe two. Five. So you've got to learn to talk in one to two sentence increments and basically then shut up. I mean, that's that's what I advise people to do. And it's not easy for people to do. How do you how do you work with a financial specialist in algorithms? to talk about algorithms in a sentence. You know, it's not easy, but there's a way to do it. There's a way to do it. Everything so, is- So I guess uh, uh, on this government question, there's also uh, uh, the add on to this. Um, are there also some things happening in Japan that would surprise maybe us, for instance, that some people who are in the know, whether that's authorities in charge or somebody else, actually leak some stuff to the media? Sure, that happens. How and do you so you know that? you know who else you know who else leaks is the police. The police leak information all the time for whatever purposes they have. You know, uh, I don't know why they do it. I, I don't ask why they do it. You know, uh, Jake Adelstein's got his his uh, Tokyo Vice uh, HBO Max series based on his book out. Maybe you can ask him uh, how that works. He knows the police beat better than I do. That's a great uh, idea. Actually, I'm taking a note right now. We should have. Uh, he's an interesting guy. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I can't uh, answer. I can't really answer the question. So okay. So let's let's move on to one that that, that yeah. I, 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 I guess the question is not does that happen. The question is how do you prepare? It's almost like a negotiation exercise that I teach here at UC San Diego, which is how do you prepare to not be left out or that they gang up on you or they somehow everybody does something so that you as a CEO is left carrying the hot potato. Well, I, I can't comment on political strategy inside an organization, but all I can comment on is what you can prepare for in media engagement. And a lot of the questions the media is going to ask you is predictable, especially with a crisis. You know, how did this happen? When did you know? Who's responsible? Who's going to take responsibility for this? Are you going to resign? Those are all predictable questions that you can make you know, your own messages and answers for. And that's what I work with CEOs and ambassadors and whatever I'm working with, billionaires. I work with them to do this. And um, I put I put a lot of heat on them. And I'm hired, you know, I'm doing a training with a CEO tomorrow in Manila. I'm, I'm hired to do the dirty work, you know. A lot of times PR teams, they have to work with this CEO in and out and they don't wanna take the risk of saying, well, you know, you're good at this, but you're not good at that. 
So they hire me for two hours to come in and clean it up. What are you going to do? Fire me for, I'm only there for two hours. Like I'll do the dirty work. I'm happy to do it. That's what I'm paid to do. Right? So, so I think that's a really important point. You can't control what others do, but you can control what you do. And so an right. effective communication strategy is to be in complete control of what you say at what point in time to whom, right? That, that would be- Well, there's another, there's another uh, issue which I, which I work with people on is, and this is the hard part, is when the unwanted or nasty questions come, how do you manage them? You know, there are certain techniques, uh, well, I'm not gonna talk about today because I want people to come back and give me a call, <laughs> but um, there are certain techniques that are tried and true that work pretty well with practice, but again, it's a skill and you've got to do this. And the, the, the beauty of what, what managing the media provides any communicator in the business world or even in the, the public sector is a chance to just be a better communicator. You know, you don't want to lie. Lying is always a bad strategy, but you know, you, we all find ourselves in situations where we don't necessarily want to tell the truth or the whole truth. And that's very different than lying. And I, I, I never encourage people to lie. That I will never do that. That's a bad strategy. Yeah, it's just, not, not going to go anywhere but so okay so uh so that's great so we're we, we we should prepare we should be prepared to answer the the questions that we can actually even expect after something goes up but the uh both bronwyn and akira wonder what we can do um and then let me just let me just read the questions out maybe the unexpected stuff so how often does news get published first by members of the public like the the the, way, the thing you started us with right twitter uh the cell phone camera uh how can a company get ahead of the citizen journalist and then the 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 follow-up question also on this is do you think that the the older generation Japanese leaders understand the influence of social media, such as Twitter and Instagram? Um, I'll start with that part first. I think they're growing in understanding of it. Uh, a lot of them become uh, involved in a crisis or a situation where they have to deal with it. How do you manage a citizen journalist the same way that you would manage a, a real journalist? You, you look at the situation and hopefully you've, you've prepared for this kind of incident where somebody's making a, a rumor about something. Yeah, you know, I can say a rumor. I can say uh, your organization uh, is being sued by three former female employees for sexual harassment. What do you have to say to that? You know, I can just tweet that out. You know, whether I get sued or not is not the, the point here. They, they know that they can be asked about rumors. I teach them how to handle rumors. They know they can be asked about things that are negative or nefarious. How do you do that? So the idea is, is to make sure you acknowledge the question and talk about what you want to talk about instead. That's the basic idea, right? If you, you've you been watching an interview somewhere on TV and you say, you know what? She didn't answer the question. Well, that tells me she didn't acknowledge it in the first place. You know, it's really important to acknowledge that the question was asked. We see politicians do it well or do it poorly all the time. Yeah. Oh, on, on that point, there's actually a question from the audience. Uh, how would you compare Abe, Suga, and Kishida in terms of crisis communications? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, since I work with the government, I'm not going to get into specific. Okay. <laughs> but let me just say that everyone has their strengths and areas of improvement. Um, there, there are very few superior speakers to the media here in Japan. Uh, I, I see them once in a while. Um, the current spokesperson for the Kishida government, um, Shitaka-san, is fantastic. I, he was, in, was involved working with him. 10 years ago when he was also in the communications office, uh, the prime minister's office at the time. Now he's running the show. And he's a very articulate, uh, skilled, sophisticated English speaker. And he knows how the media works and how to manage it. Are there a lot of people like Shikata san No, they're not, they're not. He's just a really gifted guy that has this natural knack of knowing how to do it. And he combines it with professional insight. Can we talk I, a little I, bit more about the, the Fukushima thing? Because uh, many mm -hmm. of us probably remember it and we were, are glued to the TV. And even if even those of us who weren't will remember the event, right? Um, it, it's, so, so Monday morning quarterbacking, which is, mm -hmm. you know, not, a, not really a nice thing to do, but let's just take the luxury and say, okay, we know what happened. We know what happened. We know how it all ended. It's good ended. You know, so, yep. um, uh, how could how could this have been handled better, especially maybe by the company? Well, there's a lot of 
that's been written about that. Um, my my take on it is that, that they did the, the worst thing possible, which was withhold information in the middle of a crisis where the, the, the country and the world is panicking. That was the biggest mistake that they made, right? There's a way of telling the truth with without causing a tremendous damage. You know, honesty is the best policy. We, that's a famous saying in English in the United States, and it's true. So that's one thing that I think is a critical lesson. The other thing is, um, when I watched the government uh, daily briefings in English, which I was glad the government was providing them in English because, you know, the world and people in Japan who don't speak Japanese could see it. Uh, there were lots of things going on. There were spokespersons that weren't trained. There, they were off message. They were laughing on the side when they were still on the camera. I mean, all kinds of visual and verbal mistakes were being made. And I really, I, I was just, you know, I was covering my eyes. I didn't want to look. Uh, and I, I, I immediately felt a responsibility to help Japan and get involved with this. And, you know, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs gave me permission to go into these press conferences. And I wrote very detailed uh, analysis of what was going well and what was not, and each individual spokesperson who gave them feedback. And I think I helped to to make those those press briefings a little more um, comprehensible and impactful. Uh, it's all about impact. Uh, it's all about using your skill and your insight to have a believable, trustworthy story. That's what this is all about. Oh, excuse me, I have to sneeze. Oh. Um, yeah, just allergy, no worries. Um, uh, so, so Ben is wondering, and I'm going to make this question a little, a little bit larger than he asked it. Um, the, the latest uh, quality checkup cover by Mitsubishi Electric. Uh, he, he wonders what your thoughts are on that, um, and and I want to make it a little broader. And that is, we seem to see a lot of repetitions of incompetent uh, press meetings. Uh, is there no learning? I mean, this is also a follow up to the previous thing. So I, I assume that when you were able to help these good people, they they learned fast. They were fast learners because they were basically starting from no preparation at all to being right. a little bit prepped. So immediately 100 percent improvement. Right. But uh, but why do we not see more improvement? And some of this, I mean, the Mitsubishi event, the Kobe Steel event. It's like a 50 year old practice and people don't seem to be learning much. Is it because you only have 24 hours in a given day or is it that there's no recognition that they're actually bad at it? You know, I, I can't comment on corporate culture specifically and how corporate cultures, you know, create the, the leaders that they've got and what influence is going over that. All again, I can comment on is what happens when the media engagement occurs. Uh, there, there is progress. It's better than it used to be. I know for a fact because I've trained a lot of companies. Uh, but it's a big mountain we've got to climb here. You know, most Japanese do not get trained how to manage things like assertive situations or be able to manage unexpected questions. It's a skill, and they've got to learn how to do it. And I think it's a good part of corporate governance to make sure that that your people who are at the top who engage the media are properly prepared. And, and that means including, I said earlier, a backup, a backup spokesperson, you know? Well, well, what if you're in a situation, like I'm in a crisis situation sometimes with a company with, you know, the executive team that's got 10 members, the head of this, the head of that, and everyone's looking at the crisis together, right? What if I find that there's a sleeper spokesperson that's fantastic, this young woman who's 30 years old with no title? Well, should she be the spokesperson? Well, I don't know. You know, if she's got the right uh, capabilities and skills and she's got the right look, and she's got the right package in terms of what is needed to influence the audience, maybe we should talk about that, right? I don't, I don't think just because you're the CEO that you're automatically the spokesperson. I just don't come from that world. You got to prove it to me. You know, and I, I'll tell them. I'll tell them. I'll, I, I do not hold back with these organizations. I say, my advice is X, Y, Z. So in an era of globalization, I mean, let's assume it continues, uh, it's now all global. The Nikkei is translated. Uh, you can click a little button and Google will do it for you, right? So there, this, this is also no longer just a Japanese show. 30% right. uh, or so of the stocks traded at the Tokyo Stock Exchange are held by foreign investors or in foreign accounts, right? So yep. this is all now global. Um, does Japan need to change? Um, is there is there a global standard of what's good communication, or would there actually be a strategic advantage of keeping some of this a little bit Japanese? 
uh, because we're after all we are in Japan and so not adopting global standards of, of press conferences might actually be a, a powerful move. Yeah, you know, I haven't thought of it in, in deep terms in, in that context. Um, I just know what the global standard is based on working around the world for what works. And, and that's what I stick to. I'm, I don't really get too much involved in, in cultural norms if it doesn't help achieve the goal. Uh, and again, I'm not criticizing Japan. I, I respect Japanese culture and cultural norms. I'm not in, in any position to advise any change, but I know what works and what doesn't work. And I, I do get asked, you know, what do other countries do and how would they handle it? And I often tell them this is the norm that I that I experience when I, you know, train in, in India or I train in North America or Europe or the Middle East. Um, and then they, they make their own decision. You know, why isn't Japan changing? Well, Japan is changing. It's changing in a lot of fundamental ways. We just don't see it necessarily. There's a lot of innovative companies with a lot of innovative leaders. I did a training with an IT a leader, a 50 year old guy who had an, a pierced earring and tattoos who was gonna go do an IPO. You know, Japan's changing and I wanna help them uh, be as good as they can be in front of the media. Well, I, I think we would all miss something if the empty boat went away. I wouldn't miss wouldn't know what bow. to do. <laughs> I don't like the empty bow. I, uh, I, find, I, I you know, when, uh, you know, there's levels of the bow based on level of, of remorse. And I've seen some seriously sincere bows, you know, where they get all, all on, the, on the ground, on the ground with the, the head touching the ground and they stay there for 30 seconds or a minute. And they're really sincere. They really are sincere. But, you know, these 50 year old scandals, I just, you know, you're not convincing me of any sincerity there. You don't get remorse from me. So we have time for just one last question, and I want to give you a chance to maybe uh, guide us to studying some more. Alexi wants to know uh, mm. whether you can recommend a book to be able to communicate effectively with the Japanese if you had one, and it could be one of yours, but by all means. Well, um, just a short read, and it's an older book, but there's a new version of a kiss, bow, and shake hands. Um, has you know, it's a four-page summary I found very useful on communicating with the Japanese as a whole from a cross-cultural perspective. It's a great book. It covers, I think, 60 different countries. Um, but you know, um, Ruth Benedict's Chrysanthemum and the Sword, you know, written after the war is a classic. There's all kinds of good reading out there. I don't necessarily have a favorite for sure. Um, but I, I think it's a great opportunity for Japan to continue to innovate the way in which it's communicating with the world. And I do see a lot of progress. All right. Well, on that note, uh, time is up and it flew by and, you know, without me actually going through all the questions. So thank you, audience, for uh, uh, being here. And yes, this will be our last one before the summer break. But uh, be reminded that you can watch recordings uh, on our website, jfit.ucsd.edu. And we will be back with more of uh, of uh, the same. Uh, we'll continue the Japan Zoomina when the when the quarter starts up again uh, after the summer break. Over the summer, please all uh, take good care, stay safe, and uh, have a great summer. And uh, I will hope to all see you again uh, in the fall. And thank you, David Wagner. It was thank terrific you. to have had you here. And um, uh, I'll, I'll sign up for a little bit of a communication class. You can probably make me better in so many ways. So thank you very much for being You're here. You're a great speaker. Thanks for your time. Uh, okay, everybody, take good care and uh, have a great summer. <laughs>